you for the introduction. And uh, I also want to thank the organizers of QHack for making this event happen. Uh, yeah, so in this talk, I will introduce a new algorithm for learning many value Hamiltonians with Heisenberg limit scaling. Uh, so for many of you in the audience, probably you're not really familiar with the notion of Heisenberg, but uh, please don't worry because I will explain the concept along the way. So uh, this is based on a joint work with uh, Xinyuan Huang of Caltech, uh, a DFAM from UC Berkeley, and Yuan Xu of Microsoft. So let's start with a very classical statistical task, uh, which is parameter estimation. So in parameter estimation, basically we assume that we can draw examples from a probability distribution P data that is parameterized by some uh, parameter data. So the goal is to estimate data from those samples. And uh, so a simple example is the Gaussian distribution, and uh, it is parameterized by its mean and the variance. So maybe we can just say we have a bunch of samples from this Gaussian distribution, and we want to estimate its mean and variance, which tells us the parameters of this distribution. And uh, this setting can be extended to the quantum world. So we may consider replacing this classical distribution P data with a quantum state row data or quantum channel M data. Uh, so, so for quantum channel, like we can consider some like an even more specific example where we consider unitary channel, which is this unitary U theta acting on a quantum state row. And uh, here I'm considering U theta as, sim as a simple Z rotation. Uh, when you write down the matrix, it takes the following form. So the idea is that we may want to have multiple examples of quantum state, or we may be able to apply quantum channel uh, M theta to some quantum state, and we want to learn what those thetas are. So uh, yeah, so let me first provide some motivation why should we do this? Why should we care about this task? Uh, so in the, uh, firstly, we may want to extract information from some quantum systems. So this naturally makes it necessary to consider how to extract those parameters from quantum systems. Uh, and the, the relevant setting include the gate calibration where you implement a quantum gate, but you want to make sure that what you implement actually matches what you want to implement. Uh, so this will require estimating things from the gate you're implementing. And also read, read out from quantum computation, like you need to turn quantum information into classical information. And also there may be just some quantum states that, that, or some quantum process that exists in nature or in lab, and you want to learn what it is. So this will uh, require us to do tomography. Uh, and another setting is where we have uh, some classical things we want to estimate, such as a classical field. And, but we may just want to measure it very, very precisely. And uh, oftentimes quantum technology can make us uh, like much able to, much more able to reach higher precision than uh, using only classical means. So this uh, falls into the domain of quantum metrology and the quantum sensing. So uh, an example here is the detection of the gravitational wave. So because we want to dis detect things that are like a, require very high precision, and sometimes uh, the hope is that quantum can, technology can enable us to do so much more precisely. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and there is a fundamental limit of how precise you can measure something from a finite many examples. And, and in a classical setting, it's called a kramer raw bound. Uh, now, now let's consider a, a simple Gaussian distribution here. Uh, and the uh, theta is its mean, and we want to estimate this theta. So what we can do is to draw a bunch of examples, x1, x2, all the way to x and s, where n s is the sample size, and take the average. So this average will give us an estimate of this theta, which has many, many nice properties if you have taken a statistics course. Uh, and now if we look at the, what, what kind of precision we can get from this procedure, uh, we can see that the root mean square error scales like a one over square root of ns, where ns is the number of samples. Uh, so there is this square root convergence. And uh, if we want to estimate theta to an epsilon precision, we will need to use 
epsilon to the minus two many examples. Uh, so this is actually the best we can do as guaranteed by the Kramer raw bound. Uh, so the Kramer raw bound essentially it says that if you want to estimate a parameter to precision epsilon, you will need epsilon to the minus two many examples. And this result can actually be extended to the quantum setting where we have a quantum state of raw data and we want to uh, estimate data from many copies of this quantum state. Uh, and the, so this result is called standard quantum limit. So it tells us that if we want to estimate data to precision epsilon, we will need epsilon to the minus two many copies of the quantum state. But sometimes when we estimate things in the quantum world, we can go beyond the standard quantum limit using quantum coherence. So an example here is that if we want to estimate a parameter from a unitary U theta, uh, so here I'm considering very simple unitary, which is just a Z rotation. Uh, and if we want to estimate this data from this unitary, then uh, in the first approach, we can turn it into a problem of extracting information from quantum state. So in the first approach, we let U theta act on a plus state, and then we will get a new quantum state out of it, and it, it is parameterized by this theta, theta, and we can therefore estimate theta from the quantum state. Uh, this approach, however, is subject to the standard quantum limit because we are trying to extract information from a quantum state. And if you want to get theta up to uh, epsilon precision, you will need epsilon to the minus two many examples. Uh, but in the second approach, we do something slightly different. We, instead of letting U theta act on the plus state, we, uh, like we, we let u theta act on plus state for many, many times uh, to be more specific, uh, like a k times. So this will give us a sequence of quantum states, uh, each of them parameterized by theta, but like uh, it's also indexed by k. Uh, and the idea behind doing this is that larger k increases the sensitivity with respect to theta, uh, and thus reducing the number of samples. Uh, and more specifically, we can let the largest k be of order epsilon inwards. So if theta is subject to a small perturbation of order epsilon, then you can look at the perturbation on, on the corresponding quantum state. Uh, and the perturbation will actually be of order k times epsilon. Uh, and because k is chosen to be of order epsilon inwards, uh, so this perturbation on the quantum state now becomes of order of order one, so it's a constant magnitude perturbation. And because it is actually easy to detect a, a perturbation of a O1 order, it becomes easy to de detect a perturbation in theta that is of epsilon order. So because of this, we can easily detect small perturbation in the parameter, and this increased sensitivity can help us estimate theta to very high precision. Uh, and uh, if we use this approach, the number of queries to U theta now scales like uh, epsilon inverse, which is essentially how large this K needs to be. And this is called a Heisenberg limit. So instead of uh, epsilon to the minus two as uh, required by standard quantum limit, now we have epsilon inverse. And this is basically the goal we want to achieve in estimating things like uh, very precisely. So what I just talked about can be uh, can be seen as, it's sometimes called phase estimation. Uh, and the similar idea is behind the quantum phase estimation algorithm, uh, which is useful for essentially all the exciting applications of quantum computing, such as factoring and discrete logarithm, quantum chemistry, in which you want to extract the, say, the ground state energy of a molecule, and uh, solving linear systems using the famous HHL algorithm. Uh, and Quantum phase estimation will use information about eigenvalues and eigenstates of the unitary that you're performing, uh, performing it on, and uh, or equivalently the Hamiltonian. And uh, there is actually an in, uh, intrinsic connection between the availability of eigenstates and the ability to do phase estimation. And I will actually come back to this point later on. Uh, so now I'm ready to. Uh, like uh, present the main task uh, we're, we're trying to solve for, for this talk, so uh, which is called Hamiltonian learning. 
So let us consider parameterized Hamiltonian H theta. So it's a Hamiltonian, and you input the data into it, you get a you get a Hamiltonian as a function of it. And we suppose that we can prepare a quantum state rho, uh, and let it evolve under H theta. Thus, we'll get a, a time evolved state of this form. Uh, and possibly we will also use some control during the time evolution, and at the end we perform measurement. So this this whole procedure we call it an experiment, and the Hamiltonian is about learning data from these experiments. Uh, so a simple example is uh, if H, uh, if Hamiltonian H is just data times a poly Z, then the time evolution operator is just a Z rotation, and we will know how to estimate data with Heisenberg limited scaling, as I just uh, talked about in the previous slide. Uh, but sometimes we want to consider harder problem, such as here uh, H is a, a Heisenberg model defined on a 1D chain. So it has coupling between uh, each pair of adjacent qubit on the 1D chain. And the, the parameter theta is basically all the coupling constant between those qubits. And we want to learn all these coupling constants. So this becomes a much harder problem than just learning uh, like a, a Z rotation. Uh, so in previous works, uh, people basically focused on two different goals in this task. Uh, the first goal is to make the algorithm scalable for many body systems. So by many body, I mean uh, like models such as the Heisenberg model I just mentioned, with, which, is, uh, which is not uh, like an integrable, not classically simulable. Uh, so in, in this setup, you will want to uh, make the algorithm scalable for a large many-body system without incurring a cost that is, that is exponential in a system size. So basically, they want the uh, cost of performing the experiment and uh, performing the computation to be uh, at the most a polynomial system size. Uh, so on the other hand, there are uh, also, other works that focus on achieving the Heisenberg limit. So basically, the goal is to estimate parameters very, very precisely. Uh, however, if we look at the intersection between these two categories of work, we actually see that there, uh, like, uh, not many algorithms can satisfy both. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this work uh, that I'm about to present is the only one that is able to achieve this. So uh, now I'll present the main result of our paper. Uh, we present a learning algorithm that for a low intersection Hamiltonian, or otherwise known as a bounded degree K local Hamiltonian on uh, n qubits, which is a sum of a bunch of poly operators and those poly operators you, are, you know. So for this kind of setting, we can learn all the poly coefficients uh, with uh, absolute inverse total evolution time uh, and thus achieving the Heisenberg scaling. So total evolution time here basically means uh, you add the time you spend on each experiment together, and the sum of, of all those times give you the total evolution time. Uh, so this time has a Heisenberg scaling. Uh, and if we look at the number of experiments we need to perform, it actually scales like a polylog epsilon inverse. Uh, and besides this, our algorithm is also robust against the state preparation and measurement error. Uh, it is. It does not require eigenstates or thermal states of H. Uh, it also uses only single qubit Clifford uh, or poly gates. Uh, so the first feature makes our algorithm able to uh, get to very high precision with relatively little cost. And the features two, three, and the four make it friendly to uh, experimental implementation. Uh, so now you might be asking this question, like, uh, why is it so hard to uh, achieve both scalability for many body systems and the Heisenberg limit? Why were previous algorithms not able to do this? So here I will try to explain the reason. Uh, so in a large many body system, if we look at each small subsystem, they undergo an open system dynamics. So because of this, uh, the sus subsystems become entangled with the environment, and the, the corresponding states in them become mixed state. So this is known as decoherence. Uh, and because of decoherence, sensitivity to theta uh, does not increase with time. So 
uh, if you still remember what I talked about in the in uh, when I introduced Heinsberg limit, it, it is actually very necessary to uh, get the sensitivity to increase uh, like as as you apply this unitary more and more times. Uh, however, this will fail to happen if there is decoherence. So one example we can consider is thermalization. So if your subsystem thermalizes, then however long you evolve beyond this time will be irrelevant because the, the quantum state in that subsystem just stays the same. It will stay the same as the thermal state and you will not be able to increase any sensitivity to theta. You will not be able to get any additional information and this will prevent you from achieve the Heisenberg limit. So uh, previous works generally use short time evolution so that quantum states do not have time to be entangled, uh, but reaching Heisenberg limit is only possible with long time evolution. Uh, and for integrable systems, we may use eigenstate information to uh, circumvent this problem because eigenstate can give you conserve the quantities of the Hamiltonian and therefore they are not subject to thermalization. However, such eigenstates are not efficiently computable in many body settings. So uh, yeah, so we cannot do this for many body system. Uh, so the solution we propose to fix this problem uh, is to prevent subsystems from being entangled with the environment. So this sounds like a very simple idea, but uh, we will show that it actually works. Uh, so the concrete example we consider is the uh, 1D Heisenberg model. Uh, so we first write down into a sum of local terms. So here H12 is the local term acting on uh, qubits one and two, H23 acts on qubits two and three, H34 uh, like qubits three and four and so on. Uh, and we want to perform some operations on the quantum system so that the effective Hamiltonian which is different from the like uh, original Hamiltonian. So the effective Hamiltonian takes the following form. So it's just sum of uh, local terms on the first two qubits and local terms on the qubits four and five local, uh, and local terms on qubits seven and eight. So you will see that in, in this effective Hamiltonian, qubits one and the four, they, uh, sorry, one and two, they interact with each other, but not with the rest of the system. Uh, and the same is also true for qubits four and five, seven and eight. So because of this, these qubits are like isolated from each other. So we don't need to worry about entanglement anymore. Uh, and the tricky thing is that we need to be able to do this without knowing the coefficients. Like otherwise we may consider some like uh, using shorter to cancel out those terms. But here we need to do it without knowing the coefficients like because knowing the coefficients is our goal. Uh, so uh, as a graphical illustration, let's start with a 1D Heisenberg model uh, on a chain. Each qubit interacts with its neighbors. And we do something on the qubits three, six, and nine, and so on. And, and the result is that now qubits one and two interact with each other, but they're isolated from all the other qubits, and also four and five, uh, and this is uh, seven and eight. So. Uh, we basically cut the system into little pieces that do not become entangled with each other. Uh, the main tool we use for achieving this is by inserting random polys in the, during the time evolution. Uh, so for time evolution, it is described by this time evolution operator. We first divide it into uh, a bunch of short time evolutions multiplied together, each for short time tau. Uh, and, and then we insert poly operators between those short time evolutions. So at the very beginning, we uh, apply a poly operators P1 and they evolve for short time tau and then apply poly operators P1, P2 and, and so on. So, and those poly operators Pj are uniformly randomly drawn from a set uh, which I denote by calligraphy P. So because poly operators has this property that if you, uh, like a PJ squared is equal to identity, we can move those poly operators up uh, into the exponent. So instead of, uh, instead of like a, th this form, we, we now can move those P1 into the exponent. So we, we get this Hamiltonian P1 HP1 and 
And at the second time step, we are evolving with Hamiltonian P2, H, P2. Uh, so basically, at each time step, we are evolving the system with a random Hamiltonian PJ, H, PJ. Uh, yeah, so this is basically the pr main procedure of our algorithm. And you might be wondering, like, why are we doing this? What does this achieve? Uh, so the idea actually comes from a different setting, which is Hamiltonian simulation. So in Hamiltonian simulation, we want to simulate the time evolution of a Hamiltonian by, uh, by like applying a bunch of gates. So more specifically, I'm using the Q-drift algorithm where Hamiltonian simulation is down by evolving with random Hamiltonian terms. Uh, so more specifically, let's look at a Hamiltonian. Let's say it's Hamiltonian H, which is an average of a bunch of terms, H1, H2, all the way to Hm. And then in Q-drift, the time evolution due to H is decomposed into a product of a bunch of uh, like a short time evolutions, uh, each of which is with one of those terms. Like um, basically we, at each short time, we randomly draw a Hamiltonian term. Uh, it, like for the first time step, HI1, for the second time step, HI2, where those uh, Hamiltonians are like just random. And so the advantage of using this algorithm in the setting of Hamiltonian simulation is that we can deal with a large, possibly exponential number of terms if each of them is small. And the takeaway from this algorithm is that if we evolve with a random Hamiltonian at, at each time step, then in the long run, the effective Hamiltonian is their average. And this is the idea we'll be using from the Q-drift algorithm. Now, uh, back to our setup. Uh, so so uh, from Q-drift, we have this equation, which is like evolving with random Hamiltonian, gives you, uh, like a, gives you the average dynamics. Uh, now, in our setting, uh, at each time step, we are also evolving with a random Hamiltonian, which is uh, PJH, PJ. Uh, and in the long run, you will also end up evolving with the average Hamiltonian. So we call this average Hamiltonian the effective Hamiltonian. Uh, and it, ha it has this compact form. It's basically the average of all the PHP, where P is randomly drawn from this set calligraphy P. Uh, so how does this help us isolate subsystems? Recall that our Hamiltonian can be written in this form. Uh, and we choose P to be the set of all poly operators on qubits three, six, nine, and, and so on. Basically all the uh, integer multiples of three. And then, we, and then we consider a specific poly term Q in the Hamiltonian. So, uh, the Hamiltonian, like after we perform this operation inserting all the random polys, it becomes an effective Hamiltonian uh, written in this form. And if we look at the specific term Q in it, then it gets transformed in the same way. So it, it becomes the average of all the PQP uh, for P like drawn from this, this set. Uh, and so if you remember the, the we choose P to be the set of all poly operators on these qubits. And it therefore forms a one design on, uh, on the, for the Hubert space on, on these qubits. So the effect of this transformation is essentially that we're taking a partial trace uh, of Q like uh, on, on those qubits. So those basically those qubits three, six, nine, and so on are traced out and uh, because, of, because Q is a poly operator, so if it acts non-trivially on any of these qubits, then this partial trace will be zero. So through this procedure, if Q acts non-trivially on any of those qubits, it will get canceled out in the, uh, in the Hamiltonian. So uh, more precisely, uh, this is our original Hamiltonian. It contains all the couplings between each pair of adjacent qubits. And after this transformation, uh, we get an effective Hamiltonian that has only interaction between qubits one, two, four, five, uh, and seven, eight, and so they are like isolated from each other. Uh, we can then estimate the coefficients in uh, qubits one, two, qubits four and five, qubits seven and eight. So, and then we don't need to worry about them becoming entangled with each other because there's no Hamiltonian term that can make them entangled. Uh, so for those of you who are 
expert in this kind of thing, you might be wondering, isn't this just dynamical decoupling? Uh, the answer is no, because randomness is actually quite important. Uh, whereas in dynamical decoupling, we use the deterministic uh, uh, post sequence to decouple a qubit from its environment. So without the randomness, the post sequence length in dynamical decoupling is exponential in the system size. If we have multi-qubit interaction beyond the two qubit. So, and also there is another method that is quite similar to what I just talked about, which is polytwirling. Uh, so again, isn't this just polytwirling? The answer is again, no, uh, because uh, so in polytwirling, we will apply a bunch of random poly operators to make a, an arbitrary quantum channel into a, uh, into a poly channel. Uh, and in this way, we can do error mitigation or things like that. Uh, but the answer is no, because if we apply all poly operators with equal probability, the Hamiltonian will be just entirely canceled and you will not be able to extract any useful information from it. Uh, so rather we only apply a subset of all poly operators to strategically eliminate terms that we don't want to be there uh, and, and the preserved terms that we want to extract information from. Uh, and so from the procedure, we get a new effective Hamiltonian that has the following form. We can then learn coefficients from those individual terms uh, independently and in parallel. So the, the parallel is actually a quite important feature because as we extract information from qubits one and two, we can at the same time extract information from qubits four and five because they, they just don't interact with each other. So this enables us to do things like uh, much more efficiently than otherwise would be possible. Um, and for, so for each pair of like a JSON qubits, we need to again apply random poly operators to select terms that are diagonal with respect to a certain poly eigen basis. And after, after that, we can use robust space estimation to get eigenvalues of those local terms. Uh, and this will uh, tell us what the coefficients are through a Hartmann transform. So I'm going through things very quickly here, like but like uh, because of time constraint, I'm not going into detail. But one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, robust phase estimation is robust against the spam error, and that's where the spam robustness of our algorithm comes from. Uh, so so far, I've been talking about uh, 1D example, uh, but this can be very easily extended to 2D. So now we consider a 2D system of qubits with nearest neighbor interaction. Uh, and uh, we just apply random poly operators to all the wide qubits. Uh, and the result is that uh, those wide qubits get su suppressed uh, and uh, the remaining blue qubits form pairs. Like they, uh, so they only interact with each other when they're in the same pair, but those pairs do not interact with each other. So uh, with this decoupling, we can learn Hamiltonian coefficients in each pair in parallel. Uh, and we can just color those qubits differently so we can uh, like uh, get all the couplings we want. Uh, yeah, so by going through all the different couplings, we will be able to learn all the coupling coefficients of, uh, of the qubits. So, uh, so here is a, a graphical illustration of, our, uh, of the of the procedure we are using. So basically we will initialize our quantum state, uh, our quantum system in a product state, and then perform some short time evolution, insert random poly operators, and then again, perform short time evolution and insert poly operators and so on, just keep doing it. And the effect of this procedure is that uh, the, the effective dynamics is like a, between the first two qubits uh, like the for a long time, but these these first two qubits are shielded from the rest of the system. And uh, if you look at qubit three, it like uh, nothing happens on it because it gets suppressed. Uh, qubits four and five, they will interact with each other during this long time evolution, but again, they are like uh, independent from all the other qubits. Uh, and uh, so in in this way, we are able to get long time evolution coherently, uh, like. But, but only on a small set of qubits like that are independent from each other. 
So at the end of the experiment, we perform a measurement in uh, like a single qubit basis. So in this way, we extract information that tells us about the coefficients in the Hamiltonian. So we can compare this with a uh, previous algorithm where the procedure is generally to prepare a product state, perform short time evolution, and then measure. So because, uh, because if only short time evolution is involved, it is impossible to achieve Heisenberg limit. So this, this procedure of uh, like a going through long time evolution without the coherence is actually the key to achieve Heisenberg limit. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we propose an algorithm for Hamiltonian learning that both achieves the Heisenberg limit and is scalable for many body systems. Uh, and this algorithm relies on applying random poly operators to decompose the system into non-interacting clusters using idea from Hamiltonian simulation, and more precisely, this uh, Q-drift algorithm. Uh, so for future work, we can consider, uh, uh, so in, so far I've been talking about uh, uh, like a local Hamiltonian with, uh, with bounded degree. So what that means is that each qubit only interacts with uh, constant many other qubits. However, we, there are those realistic systems where there's long range interaction. Uh, and basically each qubit will interact with uh, all the other qubits in the system. And in this kind of scenario, our, our algorithm is, uh, it still achieves the Heisenberg limit, but it's no longer very efficient with respect to the system size. So this is one thing we want to improve. Uh, another is that uh, in a realistic quantum system, uh, you will have not just uh, the Hamiltonian, but also uh, noise, such as Markovian noise, and how to incorporate uh, those part of uh, like a more realistic effecting tool or algorithm. Uh, yeah, this is another, another direction to go. Uh, and for real quantum systems, uh, so far we've been thinking about a more or less idealized quantum system where we are free to apply all the single qubit poly and Clifford gates. So this is not a very strong assumption because uh, like usually in a real quantum system, the entangling gates are the things that are hard to apply. Uh, but uh, again, like for many systems, the, there is even more restriction, like uh, there may be, it may be hard to apply certain poly gates or certain Clifford gates. So under even more severe restriction, what can we do? So that's, again, an open question. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And yeah, I've been happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I love learning about how the randomness uh, is actually useful. Like you can use the randomness uh, in a new setting like compared to what had been done before, right? Uh, the fact of having these random terms uh, allows you to get a benefit. And we usually don't, uh, I mean, in many settings, we don't like randomness. We consider it a little bit close to noise, but this time it's very different. So I like learning how the randomness can actually be put to a good use. Um, we also talked, you talked about so many topics. Uh, there's a lot to ask. Uh, so. Everybody in the chat, make sure to ask questions. We talked about Q-Drift and uh, one design and uh, a simulation and the Heisenberg limit. There's so much that you can ask about. So uh, make sure to ask your questions. This is the right space for that. Uh, but before we go to the more like technical questions oriented towards your talk, I want to ask you about you, right? Um, you took a, a path that is, it's all not necessarily obvious how to find your research direction, right? We don't always know where to start. So what was your path until you found your research direction? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So uh, nowadays I know a lot of people who work on quantum computing and they actually started working on quantum computing since high school. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I know like even high school students publishing papers on quantum algorithms and stuff. But for me, I started actually very late like uh, I only uh, learned about quantum computing at the end of my college years. <laughs> and when I started my PhD, I had no idea that I would uh, work on quantum computing. Like, at the very beginning, I was working on uh, like uh, this more traditional area of uh, computational chemistry. And uh, so in computational chemistry, there is this huge problem of the exponentially large Hilbert space. And uh, people have designed 
uh, a lot of ingenious ways to circumvent this problem, making uh, making things simulable on classical computers despite the exponential size of the superspace. Uh, but uh, like there are also a lot of obstacles to uh, extend those algorithms to make them more scalable. And uh, yeah, so when I like get more and more into this idea of quantum computing, it's just a, it offers a very simple solution to many of the problems that people were not able to tackle in a classical setting. So yeah, and uh, I find that really, really appealing. Like it's, it just offers some, some toolbox that is so elegant, so simple, and uh, can we apply them to solve problems we care about? So this, uh, yeah, so this is basically what uh, make me very excited about this idea, how I really got into uh, research in this area. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have any stories about many other things that you tried where you, in fact, decided not to go into another area of research? Well, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't say anything bad about other areas of research. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but I, I did like uh, work on like those traditional, quantum, uh, but maybe not so traditional, like a tensor network methods. And uh, uh, I, I find that compared to that, quantum computing is a much younger field. Like uh, for for the other fields, it's more like a, there has been there have been many giants who have worked on those problems, and uh, now there are yeah you're basically building on what those giants have already worked on. For quantum computing, there are definitely also a lot of uh, like uh, those giant figures, but uh, it's relatively young, and it is relatively easier to make a fundamental contribution. And uh, yeah, and yeah, one thing I like about quantum computing is that uh, I think it might be even possible, like for many years later, your the alg algorithm you design to actually be the standard for for solving a specific problem. I find that prospect uh, like uh, very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. More uh, as say established disciplines that uh, have been there for a long time, there are uh, benefits, uh, things that you may or may not like. So if you want to work in something that is already uh, huge, mm -hmm. if you want to work in something that is already huge, uh, then maybe going to one of these established disciplines and learning about something that is already, uh, I mean, it has had a lot of progress and you can, even if you make a, uh, something that looks like a small impact, it can have, it can have a huge impact in any discipline. Now, uh, for us in quantum computing, it's exciting to know that there's a little bit of unknown uh, you don't know exactly how things are gonna are gonna work out, so you are motivated, uh, maybe challenged as well by that. But as you say, uh, whatever you do can have a, a huge impact in this new field as well. Yeah, yeah. So the uncertainty is definitely part of the quantum research. Like uh, we don't know how fast the quantum computing will mature. So that's that's certainly a risk we're taking by like going into this field. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but risk comes from every every emerging new field. Like uh, like decades ago, people don't know what machine learning will achieve, right? So yeah, so that's taking the risk is definitely uh, some something you have to do when you do something exciting. Yeah, and uh, mostly also you have to enjoy the work that you're doing, whether mm -hmm. Whether it's in tensor networks or it's in experimental settings or it's in theoretical settings, uh, you have to enjoy what you do. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask a question about that. Uh, right now you're at IQIM at Caltech. Can you tell us a little bit, uh, how is it working, maybe the behind the scenes of working there? Uh, so IQIM has a very uh, lively research community and I especially like the opportunity to co connect with, like we, uh, yeah, we, we invite a lot of people to come visit IQIM and, and also there is a, yeah, so there is a huge research community at Caltech itself. So, uh, so yeah, it's a good, good place for ideas to come together and uh, produce new things. Yeah, so, uh, right. So I think it's, mm, yeah, it's just gets, gets you more opportunity to interact with uh, different people and it's a very, high concentration of talents. So I think that that's, that's actually quite, quite an exciting place for quantum research. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a little bit like the chat that we have here, a very high concentration of quantum talent, uh, people <laughs> watching your talk and the other talk. So we still have one more talk today. Uh, but before that, we have some questions for you from the audience. So uh, Quantum Learn asks, is it robust against a bit flip or sign flip error from the quantum circuit when you talked about robustness? Uh, yeah, so the robustness we, we consider here is a specific kind of model. So we, we consider like at the very beginning as you prepare the state, there is some, it undergoes an error channel. And at the end, when you perform measurement, it also undergoes an error channel. So uh, in actual experiment, actually the spam error, I think it's sometimes actually dominant. Uh, but during the time evolution, we assume there's no error. But so this is kind of, yeah, so this assumption is not entirely satisfactory, but I think it still captures the, like a leading order error, like which is at the beginning and at, at the end. So at the beginning and end, it can it can take any form, like flip, bit flip or defacing noise, any, anything that that's totally fine, as long as the magnitude is not too large. That's good to know. That's good to know because you can have very different kinds of errors. Yeah. Um, our next question is by Dentucky Kirby. Uh, they ask, there was some mention of k-local interaction somewhere. Examples here are too local, but what happens for k larger than two? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So for k larger than two, uh, this, uh, th this whole algorithm still works. So that's basically why we are designing it. Uh, for k equal to two, actually, you can use dynamic decoupling. Uh, so yeah, so basically the whole thing, why we introduce randomness is to tackle this k larger than two. But because it just uh, makes things difficult to explain <laughs> if I draw things with k larger than two. So there are talk I basically focus on k equal to two. So starting at k larger than two, k equal three, then uh, mm -hmm. dynamic coupling doesn't work anymore. And that's why uh, your work becomes so uh, valuable. Yeah, that's my understanding. But yeah, because yeah, I just cannot think of how to design a post sequence that works for k equals three with dynamic decoupling. But perhaps some people can come up with an idea. Th yeah. This is not uh, not impossible, perhaps. Yeah, that's good to know. Sometimes it's just that we don't know, and it's not necessarily mm. that it's impossible. Um, right. We have a question uh, regarding one of your slides. So I don't know if you mm. wanna go back to the slides. Yeah. So sure. the question is. In slide 17, is it the same process known as trotterization or the Hamiltonians uh, should commute uh, to apply the algorithm? Yeah, that's a really good question. So Q-drift is not the same as trotterization. In trotterization, you will apply all these terms in sequence. Like you first apply H1, then H2, and all the way to HM. And in the next step, you do it over again. So this is trotterization. And therefore, the cost will scale at least linearly with the number of terms. Uh, but here, uh, at each time step, we, we randomly draw a single term and then apply it. So this way, the cost can be independent of the number of terms. And so this is actually the key difference from trollerization. It's, it's they're not the same. Yeah. OK. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, we have another question. So this question from Sprig Litika. Uh, they ask, this transformation process still has an effect on the other Hamiltonians in that they capture some of the information in the system, right? Uh, sorry, well, other Hamiltonians, you mean like... So uh, I think they're talking uh, because you have several H's, right? H1, H2 to HM. So when you do the uh, transformation process, you have effects on different of several of these Hamiltonians, right? They, uh, uh, they capture some of the information of the system. Uh, yeah, so I, I I don't entirely understand the question, but I think if I try to interpret it, I think it, it means that like uh, after applying those poly operators, there's still some interaction between the, the part you're trying to isolate and the rest of the system. Uh, so yeah, so if, if that is the question, what the question means then, I think, uh, yeah, indeed, there is still some leftover interaction, but but it can be controlled to be arbitrarily small. And uh, yeah, and in order for the algorithm to work, we actually don't need it to be extremely small. It, it can, yeah, so there's a certain threshold and you can go below it and the, yeah, and it will be just enough. Great answer. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Our next question is from YQ Cat. Um, what does the ground state of the new effective Hamiltonian look like? Supposedly qubits are all pretty entangled. Right, so uh, the ground state will be very different, but I think the, the goal here is to learn a Hamiltonian, not to prepare the ground state. So that's, so they are, they are like a different task. And the ground state of the new Hamiltonian will just be a product state because uh, like things are entangled, uh, like unentangled. Okay, good. Um, a question from Internet7. Can you explain how the Q-drift algorithm overcomes the limitations of classical Monte Carlo simulations? Uh, yeah, so probably in classical Monte Carlo, I don't know if you can do something like that, but but they are they are just different, right? Like at each time step, you're you're still evolving the quantum system coherently. There's no decoherence goals going on, and that's why it's 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 different from classical Monte Carlo. Like in classical Monte Carlo, you you need to have a probability distribution rather than a quantum state. And when you when you force the classical Monte Carlo method to run on quantum states, you run into sign problem. Right. So uh, here here things are still acting on a quantum system, and uh, quantum coherence is preserved throughout the procedure. So I would say that's that's totally different from the classical setting, yeah. And uh, it it would still be classically hard to simulate this 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 like a decomposed uh, uh, time evolution. Okay, our next question um, from J Ted DSCC is: Do you see applications of these techniques beyond this algorithm? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think. Uh, first, uh, this high-level idea of using randomness is everywhere. Like, like you can find many, many examples of of it. Uh, and and then this, uh, I think this way of decomposing the Hamiltonian into non-interacting clusters, I think it, it can definitely become useful in settings other than just learning. Uh, yeah, learning the Hamiltonian. For example, it, it might come useful in error mitigation or like a benchmarking. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but I don't know what, where to apply it yet, but I think it would be a good research direction. Yeah, question for the audience now. <laughs> uh, so a uh, question from Shul 0 k Along those lines, uh, what does this, what implications does this have for random circuit simulation? Uh, random circuit simulation. Well, uh, here, I think, uh, right, so here, um, the random random poly operators I'm applying, they do not include the C-not gate. So things will not become entangled. So without this underlying Hamiltonian, everything is actually trivial to simulate classically. But there is this underlying Hamiltonian that that, that goes on. So it, uh, like uh, all the qubits are evolving under a Hamiltonian that you do not know. So it's, uh, so that, I think, I don't know how it relates to yeah, I, I don't really know how it relates to a classical, uh, sorry, random circuit dumping. So uh, it's definitely not easy if you consider an underlying Hamilton. Yeah, let us go with our last question then. What is the significance of achieving the Heisenberg limit by Yul Feng Lo? Yeah, so, so you, you, intuitively you might just say this is a quadratic speed up, right? Like uh, if you want to get epsilon equal to 10 to the minus three, then uh, on on one hand, you may use ten to the sixth number of samples and subject to the standard quantum limit. And using Heisenberg limit, your cost will be like ten to the uh, third power rather than ten to the fifth. So that's uh, uh, so yeah. So that's a quadratic speed up. But sometimes it it becomes uh, extremely important to have this kind of quadratic speed up. Uh, and once uh, so in uh, yeah. So in Hamiltonian learning, perhaps it's uh, more or less abstract, but uh, I think one example we have is uh, if we have like resource estimation for quantum algorithms, and for quantum algorithms that do not achieve Heisenberg limit, it can it can just run for years with uh, with the <laughs> some estimate on the like uh, how fast you can apply gates. Whereas um, if you have Heisenberg scaling, it can like greatly reduce the uh, runtime and make it more reasonable, like you can probably run within a single day rather than a whole year. So 
yeah, it's, it can become quite important in practice, although uh, theoretically you might say it's a quadratic speed up, but yeah, it's, uh, but like in practice, you actually care about the runtime. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your answers and everybody for staying active in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, you. We're gonna say goodbye, but everybody stay here. We still have one more talk. Our next talk is with Russell Huffman, Kiska Design Lead. So make sure to come back, everybody. And you, however, we have to say goodbye, though. <laughs> <laughs>